Interstellar follows a group of scientists and astronauts as they battle to secure the future of mankind. Set sometime in the future, planet Earth is failing. Human society has kicked into survival mode and the excesses of the 20th and early 21st century are no longer evident. The majority of people are farmers and they see themselves as a caretaker generation, hoping for a better life, but how that better life will materialize is not certain. Blight, a plant disease, has caused multiple crops to fail, limiting food sources. Wheat has become extinct and okra is in the process of dying off. Only corn is left. The population of the Earth has significantly decreased from what it is today. Cooper is an ex-NASA pilot turned farmer who lives with his two children and his late wife's father. He is scientifically minded and has a kindred spirit in his daughter Murph. Cooper and Murph begin to notice unexplained gravitational anomalies. Books keep being thrown off Murph's bedroom bookshelves and while she initially attributes the phenomena to a ghost, Cooper encourages her to find a more scientific answer. One day there is a dust storm and dust gathers in defined lines on Murph's bedroom floor. Cooper comes to realize that the lines are GPS coordinates left in binary code. He and a stowaway Murph drive to the coordinates only to discover a secret NASA base. There they meet a group of officials and scientists who reveal their plans for saving the human species. The lead scientist is Professor Brand who explains to Cooper that corn crops will begin to fail, leaving humanity to starve. Earth's atmosphere is made up of 80% nitrogen on which blight thrives. As blight continues to destroy plant life, less and less breathable oxygen will be released into the atmosphere through the process of plant photosynthesis. Professor Brand explains that the last surviving people on Earth who haven't starved to death will be the first to suffocate owing to the lack of oxygen. The scientists have no hope of humanity being able to continue living on Earth and the only way they can think of to save the species is to find a new home in outer space. Professor Brand declares that mankind was not meant to stay on Earth, but instead to leave it. As Cooper points out to Professor Brand, there isn't another planet in our solar system with the right conditions for sustaining life as we know it, and the nearest star system is over a thousand years away. The logistics of space travel and finding another home for humanity is impossible under those circumstances. But then Professor Brand and other scientists reveal there's more to the story. 48 years ago, a gravitational anomaly near Saturn alerted NASA to the existence of a wormhole that had been placed there by what seems to be advanced beings. Wormholes are structures that create shortcuts between vast distances of space-time, thereby circumventing the limitations of what is possible with traditional space travel. Let's define space-time. We live in a three-dimensional universe. The dimensions are up and down, left and right, and back and forth. Time can be considered a fourth dimension. Space-time is the fabric of our universe. In reality, wormholes are entirely theoretical and speculative, but in interstellar, one is used to allow space travel to occur in time frames that would be reasonable for humans to work with. The wormhole in interstellar leads to a distant galaxy that may have habitable planets. A decade earlier, NASA sent 12 pilots through the wormhole, and as a result of those expeditions, three planets have been identified as possible new homes. In theoretical physics, our universe can be thought of as a membrane floating around in a higher dimension, a fifth dimension also known as the bulk. We cannot perceive this fifth dimension, much like how a two-dimensional being that lives on a flat piece of paper would not be able to perceive our three-dimensional world. The scientists in Interstellar speculate that the beings that place the wormhole next to Saturn are benevolent fifth-dimensional beings that are able to manipulate our space-time and create a wormhole that allows us to travel to a distant galaxy in search of a new home. They don't know why these beings would be so altruistic, but mankind is desperate and any chance of survival must be taken. Professor Brand has come up with two ways of saving the human species, a plan A and a plan B. The gravitational anomalies that the scientists have observed have led them to believe that with the right information, they would be able to figure out how to manipulate gravity, enabling them to switch off or lower Earth's gravity, allowing a mass evacuation of the world's population. The plan is to house people in giant space stations until they are able to establish a new home on a habitable planet. This is where Cooper comes in. 
Professor Brand wants him to join a crew on their upcoming mission to journey through the wormhole to establish which of the three planets identified as potential new homes is the best option. Professor Brand tells Cooper that by the time Cooper returns home, he intends to have solved the theory of gravity via his gravitational equations, revealing how to successfully control and influence Earth's gravity. If plan A fails, there is plan B, a population bomb. Cooper and his crew will carry with them 5,000 fertilized eggs, which have been pre-selected to guarantee genetic diversity. The more genetic diversity a species has, the better the chance of their survival. The first 10 of the presumably genetically female eggs would be incubated and once these females come of age, they would be used as surrogates for more eggs and so on and so forth until a colony of humans were established. These plans are presented in simplistic terms, but there are huge challenges to both. In plan A, switching off or lowering Earth's gravity would have devastating consequences for the planet. Even a short period without gravity would mean earthquakes, volcanoes and floods, to name but a few ramifications. When it comes to plan B and the population bomb, the ethics of attempting to subjugate women and use their bodies for the establishment of a human colony, as well as the complicated logistics of rearing human children, is not addressed. Neither plan A or plan B are realistic. However, for the sake of the movie, we must suspend our disbelief. The crew that will travel through the wormhole and look for alternative homes consists of Cooper, who will be the mission commander, Professor Brand's daughter, Dr. Amelia Brand, and two other scientists, Doyle and Romilly. They also have with them two ex-military support robots, TARS and CASE. The ship that will carry them on their voyage is named Endurance, and they also have with them four spacecrafts, two aerodynamic sleek shuttles called Rangers and two heavy lifting supply vehicles called Landers. With his equations of relativity, Einstein revealed something stunning about the nature of time. Time is not absolute. It is not the same for everyone. It is, in fact, relative. If person A is moving at speeds close to the speed of light in comparison to person B, then their time slows down relative to person B. Another instance of time slowing down for a person is when they're in a stronger gravitational field relative to a weaker gravitational field. For example, Jupiter is much more massive than Earth, and its gravity is 2.4 times that of Earth which means every second on Jupiter is roughly 20 nanoseconds slower than a second on Earth. When Cooper is attempting to comfort Murph before he goes away, he explains to her that time will run more slowly for him than for her. She will remain on Earth and in comparison to her, he may travel at speeds close to the speed of light or he may end up near a black hole where the gravity is so powerful that nothing can escape it, not even light. Cooper mentions one more instance of when time will slow down for him, and that's when he is in hypersleep. Interstellar shows astronauts using pods to put themselves into suspended animation, which slows down their biological functions until it is time to reanimate. Using the pods significantly delays the aging process of the human body. All this is cold comfort for Murph, and she tries to convince Cooper to stay with her on Earth, even telling him that she's decoded what the throne books from her bookshelf means. It's a message in Morse code telling Cooper to stay. After the crew pass through the wormhole, they have to decide which of the three potentially habitable planets to visit first. There's Miller's planet, Man's planet and Edmund's planet, all named after the astronauts that visited each respective planet. The crew decide to visit Miller's planet first, as it's the closest to them and the data they have received from Miller indicates that the planet is a promising option. However, there is one huge drawback to visiting Miller's planet. It lies very close to a supermassive spinning black hole called Gargantua, and as it is in such a powerful gravitational field, the time on that planet runs significantly slower than the time on Earth. In fact, one hour on Miller's planet equates to seven years on Earth. Bearing this in mind, the crew decide to keep endurance out of the powerful gravitational field to avoid the extreme time dilation on the ship, and instead they decide to use a ranger to go down to the planet. The plan is to collect Miller and her data as quickly as possible and the hope is that they'll only lose out on a couple of years on Earth. Cooper, Brand, Doyle and Case travel to Miller's planet while Romilly and Tars stay behind. Almost as soon as the crew reach Miller's planet, they encounter problems. The world is covered by a knee-deep ocean and they find wreckage of Miller's vehicle. 
Because of the extreme time dilation on Miller's planet, even though over a decade has passed for the crew, from Miller's perspective, she would have landed on the planet just a short time before them, and Brand guesses that Miller must have died moments before they landed. Miller's initial impression of the planet must have been favourable, hence her positive feedback back to Earth, but the water on Miller's planet is a problem. Gargantua's huge gravitational pull results in huge swells of water on Miller's planet. The Earth experiences a similar tidal effect owing to the gravitational pull of the Moon and the Sun. Our oceans have high tides and low tides because of these tidal forces. Our Earth is tidally locked in position with the Moon, meaning that the Moon rotates about its axis in about the same time it takes to orbit the Earth. So the Earth always sees the same side of the Moon. But Miller's planet is not tidally locked with Gargantua. Instead, it oscillates back and forth, which in turn causes the planet's huge tidal waves that the crew encounter. It was presumably one such tidal wave that killed Miller. Brand's determination to retrieve Miller's data results in her getting trapped amongst some of Miller's wreckage. And while the crew do manage to rescue her, there are repercussions. Doyle gets swept up by a giant tidal wave, and the ranger becomes too waterlogged to exit the planet, which means they have to wait until enough water drains away for the engines to work again. The longer they are on the planet, the more time slips away on Earth. Cooper, knowing he has two young children back on Earth, is crushed to realise he will miss out on decades of their lives. What are hours delay on Miller's planet ends up being 23 years back on Earth. When the crew are back together on Endurance, they regroup and discuss what they found or rather did not find on Miller's planet. There was no indication of life and the planet appeared to be sterile. Brand reasons that that close to a black hole means that life is not able to appear because Gargantua sucks up all the possible accidents and events that could have led to the appearance of life. The group must now decide what to do for the rest of their mission. The initial plan was to visit all three potential planets, but given the time that has elapsed while the crew were on Miller's planet, Endurance no longer has the resources for all those journeys. They have to choose between the two remaining planets, Man's planet and Edmund's planet. Brand argues in favour of Edmund's planet, as his data is more favourable and his planet is further away from the gravitational pull of Gargantua. But Brand also advocates for Edmund's planet because she is in love with Edmund's. She argues that her love for him can be thought of as akin to time and gravity, both of which can reach across the universe, like her love for Edmunds. She is drawn to be with him, and while that doesn't seem very scientific, the force of her love should count for something. However, her arguments don't persuade Cooper or Romilly. Edmunds has stopped transmitting his data while Mann continues to do so, and so they decide to visit Mann's planet, and there they are met with a frozen ice world. Man is in a long hypersleep from which they wake him and he is overcome to see other human beings. He reports that his planet has all the elements needed for life at the surface, but it is later revealed that man is lying. There is no surface to speak of. The planet is a sponge-like network of frozen cloud mountains and there is no breathable atmosphere for humans. Man has manipulated his data in order to be rescued from the planet. When man discovered that his planet was not habitable, he was not prepared to die there alone. After man's duplicity is found out, he steals a ranger and attempts to manually dock on the Endurance in order to take it over and make his escape. However, he is unsuccessful and an airlock explodes, killing him and sending the Endurance into a rapid spin. Once Cooper and Brand are able to get the Endurance back under control, the Endurance is slipping towards Gargantua and is no longer able to take them back to Earth or onto Edmund's planet. This is when Cooper decides to use the gravity of Gargantua to perform a slingshot maneuver which will give Endurance the momentum it needs to make it to Edmund's planet. Cooper also realises that Endurance will need to shed some weight to make that possible, and so he and Tars, in a ranger and lander respectively, detach from the Endurance and enter Gargantua. In a last-ditch effort to save the humanity they have left behind, they want to send back whatever data they can gather from inside the black hole back to Earth to help solve Professor Brand's gravitational equations. A black hole is formed when a sufficiently large star runs out of fuel and then collapses under its own gravity into a single point containing all of its mass. 
This point is called the singularity and the mathematics we use to explain the physical world around us, namely Einstein's theory of relativity and also quantum mechanics, both break down at this point, and so we do not know what happens at the singularity. If Cooper and Haas are able to relay the quantum data of what happens in a singularity, then a now grown up Murph on Earth would have the information she needs to solve the gravity equations. The event horizon of a black hole is a boundary where the velocity needed to escape it exceeds the speed of light, and it is a fundamental property of our universe that nothing can exceed the speed of light. Once something crosses the event horizon, its only possible future is to go to the centre of the black hole, that is, towards the singularity. But what would actually happen if someone were to fall into a black hole? The force of gravity at their feet would be millions of times the force of gravity at their head, and the result would be that the person would be stretched and then ripped apart to become a stream of matter. This process is known as spaghettification. However, owing to the sheer size and age of Gargantua, the tidal forces acting across the body would not initially be that extreme, and Interstellar describes this as a gentle singularity, which would allow Cooper and Tars to remain intact for a time. In the end, spaghettification and death don't transpire, as both Cooper and Tars are swept up into what seems to be an endless library that looks into Murph's childhood bedroom. This is in fact a tesseract, or rather a hypercube. A tesseract is to a cube what a cube is to a square. Cooper realises he is able to move objects in Murph's bedroom using gravity, and he attempts to stop his past self from going on the endurance mission. It was he who threw the books off Murph's bookshelf and used Morse code to write the word stay. When Cooper was first recruited to go on his mission, he was excited about the possibility of leaving Earth. He wasn't satisfied with the life he had, and he wanted to do something more. But after everything he has been through and all that he has missed, Cooper wishes he had remained with his children. However, he is unable to change the past. After some time passes, Cooper reconnects with Taz in the Tesseract, and together they realise that the beings who had created the wormhole have also provided them with a way to relay information back to Earth, as Cooper is able to use gravity via the Tesseract to influence events in Murph's bedroom at any given moment. Taz has collected the quantum data that Murph needs to solve the gravity equations, and Cooper uses Morse code to encode that information into the second hand of a watch that he gave Murph on the day of his departure. On Earth, the grown-up Murph realises that the ghost she thought was in her bedroom was actually someone or something trying to communicate with her. She revisits her bedroom and tries to decipher what it all means, when suddenly, upon seeing the movement of the second hand on her watch, everything falls into place. She has what she needs to solve Professor Brand's gravity equations, and Plan A can be executed after all. After Cooper enters the Tesseract, he surmises that the mysterious they are not advanced alien beings, but rather future humans who have advanced to the point that they are able to experience higher dimensions. These future humans are able to create the circumstances needed for the survival of their ancestors by creating wormholes and tesseracts. Although Brown's interpretation of love being similar to time and gravity is initially dismissed by Cooper, he comes to realise that her description was in fact accurate. His love for Murph, and vice versa, allowed them to communicate through space and time. Cooper's love for his family, Brand's love for Edmunds, and Professor Brand's love for the human species are powerful forces that drive the story forward and ultimately help to secure mankind's future. Love, it turns out, is just as influential as time and gravity. And with that, we come to the end of our explanation and analysis of the science and story of Interstellar. As always, I hope you enjoyed this video. Please make sure to like, comment and subscribe and I'll see you next time.